Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his followers went as far as Capernaum. And as soon as the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. And his teaching made a deep impression on them because, unlike the scribes, he taught them with authority. In their synagogue just then, there was a man possessed by an unclean spirit, and it shouted, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus said sharply, Be quiet, come out of him. And the unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions, and with a loud cry went out of him. The people were so astonished that they started asking each other what it all meant. Here is a teaching that is new, they said, and with authority behind it. He gives orders to the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And his reputation rapidly spread everywhere through all the surrounding Galilean countryside. The Gospel of the Lord. In Mark's gospel, we begin with the good news of Jesus Christ, and we do a few little things. Um, we, we have the going into the desert, and then we have Jesus coming into his public ministry. So the text that we have today is his first public appearance in the gospel of Mark, and, and that's important. Now, Mark is, a, is the shortest of all the gospels. It's, it's, it's just condensed in terms of all the other, the, the other three Gospels. And, and uh, so often in Mark, and immediately he does this, and immediately it's as if Mark is, is in speed and in a pace to demonstrate what this mystery, what this good news of Jesus Christ is really about. So we, we meet Jesus, and he's preaching in Capernaum, and they, they say that he teaches, his teaching made a deep impression on them because unlike the scribes, he taught them with authority. Now that's quite interesting. Unlike the scribes, he taught them with authority. And down at the end, it says again, his reputation rapidly spread. Here is a teaching that is new, they said, and with authority behind it. In the second instance, they just saw something marvelous, uh, exorcism. But in the first instance, all they had was his words. And to understand what this means in Mark, we have to go back to our first reading, where in our first reading in the book of Deuteronomy, Joseph, sorry, Moses at, at the end is prophesying that there will be another Moses who will come, another Moses who will teach, and, and whose teaching will lead the people as the first Moses did. We have to remember that Moses received a ragtag band of people who had no center, and, and no sense of who their God was. And, and through the 40 years in the desert, he got that ragtag band from a dispersed group into becoming a people. And the teaching of Moses was what founded Israel. He adjudicated and gave them the law, gave them the sense of morality. Through Moses, God revealed what true worship was. Through Moses, they received the Ten Commandments. Through Moses, they received everything that they needed to become a community to become a people, to have an identity, to be different from others. And so Moses is here and he said, you know, do not let, let me hear it again. You, you say, the voice of the Lord, your, my God, not look any longer on this great fire 
or I shall die. And in the Lord, and the Lord said to me, all they have spoken is well said. I will raise up a prophet like yourself for them from their own brothers, and I will put my words into his mouth, and he shall tell all I command him. And it is that prophecy why we have the first reading. Because Moses already prophesied that another Moses will come, and that Moses will receive all the words that God wants to speak, and that Moses will be raised up as a prophet like the first Moses, and that Moses will, will tell all that God commands. So when you see that here in our first reading, we have to understand that Mark is saying that that prophecy is being fulfilled. A first century Jew would have known that prophecy. And a first century Jew was expecting both a new Moses and a new, Masa a new Elijah to come. And a first century Jew would have expected that somehow God will give them a new Moses and a Messiah that will lead them. And so when they say that his teaching made a deep impression on them, because unlike the scribes, he taught them with authority, they're saying that, could this be the new Moses that we are waiting on? Could this be him? Could this be the moment when God will raise that new Moses and when that prophecy of Moses will be fulfilled? And so that's kind of our context in, in our reading. But it goes on. Then all of a sudden, Jesus is preaching. He's preaching with authority. And Mark says, in their synagogue, just then, there was a man possessed by an unclean spirit. Now, you know, I do have an easy way to say this, huh? Yeah, 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 you know, you, you know the truth. When Jesus starts his ministry, the first thing he deals with is the church devils. The first thing he deals with is what? Where's the man? Right there in the synagogue. He not outside in the public, you know. He not, he not in the political court. He, he not with the, with the merchants in commerce. This, this demon is right there in the synagogue. So let me call him a church devil. Are you good with that? OK. And, and we have to hear this, that the first thing that Jesus deals with is the church devils. Evil that is existing right inside of the place where God should be worshipped. Evil that is existing right in the place where that should be set aside for the worship of God. Now, in the structure of Israel, the synagogue is like a local assembly hall, which is different from the temple in Jerusalem. Here in the, in the synagogues, what you, what you have is it's, it's lay people that conduct the synagogue come together on the Sabbath, and one of the more known ones, maybe a, a Pharisee, might come forward and unroll the scroll and read and, and interpret the scroll for the, for the assembly. But, but it is a gathering of, uh, for worship and for prayer. It is a gathering set aside for the worship of God. It is a gathering that is set aside for, for God and for God's glory. And right there in the midst of this gathering set aside for God and God's glory, we find a devil. Thank God. Thank God. Oh God, oh help me Thank God. We have none to exercise, you see? <laughs> When you see division in the church, that's the work of evil. Jesus died that they may be one. 
and, and that their oneness would display the truth, the truth that Jesus was sent with God, sent from God. And so whenever you see divisiveness in the church, that's, that's evil at the very heart of the church. There's a difference with a, a difference of opinion. I disagree with you. That's different. We've had this difference of opinion from the very beginning with Paul and Peter and, and with the apostles themselves. And we've had difference of opinion. That's different from divisiveness, where what is being spread is not just that I have a different opinion from you, that you are actually evil and you are actually wrong. Recently, I saw somebody sending around a meme with the Holy Father sitting next to the devil in conversation. Now, that's divisiveness. That's, that's evil. When, when Jesus says that the bark of Peter will never lead us astray, that he will be with it always, I prefer to stay with the Holy Father and trust that God and his Holy Spirit will lead us as church Amen. than to go by myself and hope by myself that I could find a pathway that is better than the pathway that God himself instituted through the Pope. Amen. Whatever troubles we might have, when you see people deriding the Holy Father and, and speaking evil as if he is evil, well, that's exactly what they did to Jesus when they said that it's true, the prince of devils, that he casts out devils. Exactly what they did. And so we have to be wise in our time that there is evil. You know, the modern, the modern myth is that, no, nah, no, nah, there are no evil. They are not, nah, that, that is old time folklore foolishness. Duen and Sukhya and them, them, them old time people used to spread this foolishness. Well, from the beginning, there was evil. There was evil in the church, and they had the church devils then. And guess what? Is you say it? I didn't say nothing yet. <laughs> I ain't said nothing yet. <laughs> Is all you said? <laughs> let's, let's look at what happens. In the, in the synagogue just then, there was a man possessed by an unclean spirit, and it shouted, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Well, the answer is yes. That's why he came, to destroy evil. That's why he came. And, and in this one little line, have you come to destroy us, is, is a whole reading way, way back to Genesis with the fall. And as soon as the fall happened, the prophecy from God himself was that the, I will set enmity between you, your offspring, and the offspring of the woman. It will strike as his heel, but he will crush his head. From, from the very beginning, it was prophesied that one who will come will crush the head of the mighty serpent and do damage to evil and destroy evil. And so it's ironic that, this, that it is the devil himself that is telling us what the mission of Jesus is. All the healings, all of the miracles, all of the everything else that we see in Mark's gospel that we will be reading this year, everything in it is pointing to one single thing, that evil will be destroyed. Evil will be destroyed. It, it cannot stand. It cannot. It goes on to say, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, naming someone is to have power over them. Eh? Remember when Jesus names the, the devils as legion. Who are, what's your name? Legion. And then he casts out legion. The devil is actually trying to exercise Jesus. He's trying to have power over Jesus by naming him as Holy One of God. Now, Holy One of God sounds a little curious to us, but if you go back into the Psalms, you will see in one of our Psalms that Aaron is called the Holy One of God. The Holy One. The high priest is the Holy One. And so what the devil saw was that Jesus was the high priest. 
He's not just a Messiah. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a holy man. This one is a high priest. And, and, and by, by recognizing Jesus' mission, he came to destroy evil. And recognizing his office as high priest, we already have at the very beginning of Mark everything we need to know for the whole of the gospel. Jesus is a high priest who comes to destroy evil. Later on in Mark, there's a cryptic text when Jesus, they accuse him of being a devil and casting out evil by the devil. And he says, no one can burgle a strong man house unless he first binds him and ties him up. Only then he can burgle a strong man's house. So Jesus is the one who bound and tied up the strong man, Satan, and then burgled his house. This spoiled him of all the goodies that he had. When does he do this? He does it as high priest. Because the high priest in Israel once a year made a sacrifice. And once a year the high priest would slaughter an innocent lamb. And by the slaughtering of the innocent lamb, the spotless lamb, the high priest and the blood of the lamb would then expiate the sins of the people and the sins of the priest himself. Jesus as the spotless one as a sinless one, as the lamb who was slain, who was both spotless and sinless, by that lamb and the blood of that lamb on the cross, Jesus as high priest expiates the sins of all humanity. And because he is high priest, he has the power to do ritual sacrifice, to expiate sin. And because he is God, that expiation of sin happens not just at the moment of the crucifixion. Because he is God, he was in the beginning, he will be in the end. And that means that that moment of expiation, that act of cleansing evil and cleansing our sin, goes right back to the beginning from the very first sin and continues right back to the end. And that's why we can't believe in karma. Karma is interrupted by the blood of Jesus Christ, high priest who expiates the sins of the world. That means that there's no return for your sin because it has been absorbed in that single act of love on the cross. Mark is already giving us the theology of the cross, already telling us what is to come, already like any good book you know, or movie, in the first five minutes, you know everything you're supposed to know about it anyhow. And Mark, this is only chapter 1, verse 21 to 28, okay? But already in the very beginning of Mark, we know we have a preview of coming attractions. So we know who you are. It shouted, the Holy One of God. Yes, he is the high priest. Have you come to destroy us? Yes, he came to destroy evil. And everything we do, everything we do, brothers and sisters, we must make choice now. Jesus has despoiled the house of the strong man. He both tie him up and burgle his house. So what is he left with? Only the power to chain up your head. That's all you know. The power to chain up your head. The power of temptation, the power of suggestion, the power of changing your thoughts, the power to make you feel that he is real, the power to make you believe that you don't need this God, the power of temptation is what he's left with, basically. And if you're stupid enough to open your heart and ask him to come, then the power to possess. But you have, to, you have to open yourself to that. Because he doesn't have the power to do it anymore. Except you open yourself to it. The same way that God cannot come into our heart except we invite God, Satan cannot come into us unless we invite Satan. Jesus already destroyed the, the strong man and his house. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid 
of evil. Evil has already been taken care of at the foot of the cross. Do not be afraid of evil. Do not be afraid. We know how the ending will be. Because we know in the end, all things will come together under Christ. We know that. Is the drama between now and that end? That's our problem. And that's why every day we must make choice to do what is good and avoid what is evil. That's why every day the choices we make are so important. Because as we make choice to avoid evil and do good, we make choice to witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. He has the power to destroy evil and has despoiled the house of Satan. He is high priest. And we, his subjects, when we choose evil and avoid good, all we do is do a counter witness to what the truth is. That's all we're doing, a counter witness to what the truth is. Let us today recognize the power of Jesus as high priest, the power of Jesus to destroy evil, and the power of Jesus to save us in the midst of all of our temptations, from all that ravages us inside. Because that guy is just an idiot with a lot of smoke and fury, and he can't do nothing because the blood of Jesus Christ has already conquered the world. Amen. Amen.